take a look round one of the clubs and catch up with all of yesterday's go goals. It's football second. Football second with Nationwide. Football matters. Hello and welcome to Football Second on the penultimate weekend of action in Division 2. Now we're here at the Withdean Stadium, home of Brighton and Hove Albion. Last year they were promoted from the 3rd Division and they've already been promoted from the 2nd Division. By the end of today though, they could be champions. Coming up this week, we speak to Peter Taylor about all things Brighton. Will they go up as champions? Will Zamora stay? And will the manager sign a new contract for next season? We'll have all the action in the division, including the important games at the top. Reading need a win against Peterborough to keep up their charge and could seal promotion if results go their way. Brentford faced a difficult short trip to neighbours QPR who still harbour playoff ambitions. A defeat there for the Bees could mean an end to their hopes for an automatic promotion place. At the bottom of the table, we'll also see if Berry can climb out of their relegation place with a win over Colchester in what would be an emotional afternoon with the prospect of it being the Shakers' last ever home game. And we'll have extended highlights of Brighton's home game against Swindon with a win for the Seagulls, meaning the championship will be theirs. Well, it's that time of year again when the slide rule replaces the form guide and relegation and promotion are decided by a point here or a goal there. Going into Saturday's games, each side had two games remaining and there was still plenty to play for. Brighton's 1-0 away win over Peterborough last Saturday was enough to secure automatic promotion for the second successive year. And they did it without kicking a ball. Reading's seventh draw in eight games at Prenton Park on Sunday was enough to send the Seagulls up. Two other teams with their eyes on promotion, Huddersfield and Cardiff, went head-to-head -head on Tuesday night, drawing two all and maintaining their playoff places. And Swindon beat Cambridge 2-1 at the Abbey. Cambridge, of course, were already down, but they were joined last weekend by Wrexham, despite them beating Cambridge 5-0. Lee Jones got all five, and he probably had no idea whether to pop open the champagne or drown his sorrows. So, going into Saturday's games, Bournemouth were as good as down. Six points adrift and just two games to go, only a goal difference miracle would save them now. But for that other relegation spot, Perm won from four. Berry were in most danger, three points adrift of Notts County, but they had to go to high-flying Cardiff, whereas the Shakers had a very winnable home game against Colchester, who had nothing to play for. And Northampton and Chesterfield needed a win to be absolutely sure of safety. With Brighton already up, the race for the second automatic promotion place was as close as ever. One point separated Reading, who were at home to Peterborough, from Brentford, who had to cross West London to take on their local rivals, QPR, at Loftus Road. So a win for Reading and defeat for Brentford would see the Royals promoted. Any other outcome would see the battle go to the final day of the season when the two teams would meet at Griffin Park. Cardiff and Stoke could mathematically still just about make it straight up, but in all likelihood they look destined for the playoffs alongside Huddersfield. Although Bristol City and even QPR still had a theoretical chance of making it into the playoffs. Right, let's get straight down to some of the action, starting with Danny Wilson's last ditch attempt to see his side gain promotion. Bristol City were at Blackpool. Bristol City's playoff hopes were ended by a masterclass in finishing from Blackpool. With the LDV trophy already in the cabinet, they set about finishing the season in style. Richard Walker gave them the lead after just nine minutes. John Murphy provided the cross. 3,000 fans had made the journey from the West Country, but they saw their side go two down four minutes later. Walker returning the favour for Murphy to net his 18th goal of the season. Number 19 wasn't far behind. Again, Walker, signed from Aston Villa, was involved. He provided Rick Wellens with a crossing opportunity, turned home by Murphy. Danny Wilson's side were really up against it, and they were stunned by a fourth goal after just 34 minutes. Six defenders and the goalkeeper failed to prevent Martin Bullock's shot going in, and the playoff dream was disappearing fast. City's biggest defeat of the season was confirmed when John Hills added a fifth, 
three minutes into the second half and Blackpool were cruising. Tony Thorpe pulled a consolation back, but Blackpool ran out comfortable winners. Bristol City face another season in Division 2. If Mark Bridge Wilkinson had been fit to play more games, Port Vale might not now be 13th in the table. His classy free kick opened the scoring after seven minutes. But some crazy defending allowed Delroy Facey to equalise just before the break. Surely it should have been a keeper's ball. Facey's another who suffered with injuries and that was just his second goal of the season. Talking of keepers, Huddersfield's Martin Margotson did well to keep the score at one each and provide a platform for substitute Andy Booth to score what turned out to be a very important winning goal. A sixth straight home win has secured Stoke's spot in the top six and kept alive their chances of fourth place, which carries the advantage of a home second leg in the playoffs. Only one goal was needed to beat relegated Wrexham. Andy Cook finished off Mark Goodfellow's hard work on the half hour. And Stoke was certainly in the mood for more goals. From Clive Clark's cross and Cook's setup, Dion Burton couldn't beat Christian Rogers. But a second for the home side was never likely to be necessary. This was their 16th win out of 17 against Wrexham, who failed to score in 10 of those games. Andy Morell went closest for Dennis Smith's side in the second half. But the Wrexham manager's hopes of a happy return to his old club were hit by an injury to last week's five-goal hero Lee Jones. And only Rogers prevented a heavier defeat, keeping out substitute Chris Uwalumo's header from Barney Goodjonsson's free kick. Stoke hitting form at just the right time, especially at the Britannia. Cardiff secured a playoff place, beating a Notts County side still trying to hold on to their Division 2 status. Six wins in eight games had helped their cause, and they went ahead at Ninian Park thanks to Richard Liebert's 12th minute effort. Liebert's 100th league start for County and a good way to celebrate. Cardiff boss Lenny Lawrence had gone with three strikers in a bid to win the game. Rob Earnshaw went mighty close to an equaliser. The ball had judged not to have crossed the line. But County were looking for a second and they also hit the woodwork. Nick Fenton with the header. Paul Heffernan will perhaps feel he should have done better with the rebound. Cardiff levelled seven minutes into the second half and it came from a Graham Kavanagh corner. Leo Fortune West and Scott Young both claimed the final touch. The goal was credited to Fortune West. A point would have kept knots up, but in search of a winner they hit the woodwork again. Gary Hours cross and Heffernan again unable to supply the finish. That miss was to prove costly as County were undone by another Kavanagh set piece. No doubt about Young's touch this time. The playoffs for Cardiff and Neil Kinnock was delighted. Well, don't forget, still to come in the rest of the programme, we'll catch up on the battle for the other automatic promotion place, and we'll be watching Brighton as they attempt to prize open the champagne cork when they entertain Swindon at home. But first of all, here's some of the rest of the news from Division 2. Wrexham owner and chairman Price Griffiths has confirmed the club will be sold in the near future. The Red Dragons chairman confirmed that he feels an announcement will be made in the next two to three weeks. Property developer Mark Gutterman is believed to be ready to step in and take over the newly relegated side. Oldham chairman Chris Moore is determined to buy Boundary Park and has increased his stake in the club to help him achieve his aim. Moore currently owns 52.9% of existing shares, but at an EGM it was agreed the club's share capital is to be increased from £20,000 to £230,000. Moore revealed that the new share issue is all geared to improving the stadium and the long-term security of the club. Blackpool boss Steve McMahon is understood to be prepared to gamble on Bradford's former England midfielder Lee Sharp. The injury-prone 30-year-old who once moved from Manchester United to Leeds for £4.5 million is available on a free transfer. Colchester boss Steve Whitten is lining up an ambitious swoop on neighbours Ipswich for veteran defender Mark Venus. Town chairman David Sheepshanks has admitted that the club will be forced to slash the size of their playing squad and Witten hopes Venus's affinity for the area and as a regular spectator at Lair Road, it could persuade him to drop down two divisions. Wigan striker Paul Dalglish has gone to the United States for a one-week trial with major soccer league side DC United. Paul Jewell has told the 25-year-old striker his services will no longer be required at the JJD Stadium. 
Right after the break, we'll be talking to the Brighton chairman, Dick Knight, and their manager, Peter Taylor, who will be sitting here. But for how much longer? Football second with Nation. Football matters. Dave Jones's Wolverhampton Wanderers have suffered a dip in form and the Premiership is no longer a certainty. Big disappointment, but it's not over yet and we'll bounce back. Wolves must beat Wimbledon to keep their automatic promotion hopes alive. It's live and exclusive today from 12.30 on the ITV Sport Channel. Football second with Nationwide. Football matters. Welcome back to Football Seconds. Now, it's not often that you visit a club where the chairman, the leading striker and the manager are all heroes. But here at Brighton, in Dick Knight, Bobby Zamora and Peter Taylor, they've got three of the highest order. Peter Taylor has been through it all in his fledgling managerial career. Promotion with Gillingham, guiding Leicester briefly to the top of the Premier League and managing England in the Olympic Stadium in Rome, and then into freefall at Filbert Street, and with his reputation severely dented, straight into the arms of Brighton, still mourning the departure of Mickey Adams. Well, I keep doing this. I keep at Gillingham. I took over from Tony Pulis, who was a uh, who was, uh, they absolutely idolised. Yeah, of course, the Martin O'Neill situation, um, and this one again. You know, and you say to yourself, you know, why can't I take over from somebody that's a, a lot easier to take over from? Um, so, of course, you've got your doubts, you've got your worries, and I did know that my next move, uh, I couldn't have the same kind of results that I had at Leicester the second uh, second season I was there, because then all of a sudden I am on that uh, on that on that slide. But Brighton's promotion has fully justified his self-belief. I had no hesitation and no doubts of, of walking into a change room and talking to 20 players uh, because I was up for the job and, um, and to me it didn't take them long, you know, and uh, there was a few slight adjustments that, uh, that were made, uh, but things have gone really well. Indeed they have. Promotion was clinched last Sunday when Reading could only draw at Prenton Park. That put Brighton up without having to kick a ball. I was at home uh, and got the call from the physio who had actually listened, been listening to it on the local radio in Brighton, which I, I actually couldn't. I couldn't listen to it. Me, I, I, that had driven me mad. Um, so uh, eventually, of course, we realised we were up and uh, phoned all the players up and thanked them and uh, I was really delighted for them. Have they celebrated at all? Have they, out? Have they been partying or have they kept a lid on that so far? No, no, looking at them on Monday morning, they definitely went out Sunday <laughs> night, without a doubt, because uh, some of the touch all of a sudden wasn't there. And, uh, I didn't give him any heading exercises that, uh, that morning. So Division 1 has become a reality, a considerable achievement, but possibly also a poison chalice. With a capacity of only 7,000, they'll struggle to pay first division money, and they'll struggle to keep hold of the talismanic Bobby Zamora. We're going to do everything we can to keep him, uh, and I think Bobby is a very sensible lad that, that probably does realise that another 12 months in Division 1 will be very good for his education, because there's no doubt about it, he wants to be an international player, he wants to be in the Premier Division, uh, but he probably realises as well that he's not 100% ready yet, so another year uh, with us in Division 1 I think will be good news. The other question mark surrounds the manager himself. He's yet to sign a new contract, even though he insists that his prevarication is only because he's unhappy with the facilities at his disposal, and not because Crystal Palace, or anyone else for that matter, has tapped him on the shoulder. There's been no offers, I've never spoken to anybody, I've assured uh, Dick Knight of that. Uh, I told him this of the first week I was in, in, in the job because I couldn't believe um, that things weren't uh, getting prepared for us for training, etc. Um, so what we basically need is uh, probably half a dozen groundsmen around Sussex University that are season ticket holders and football fanatics of Brighton because then they would work day and night to get things the way we want it. And uh, So no, it's not me uh, putting a gun to anybody's head there, it's something that I probably coming from Leicester and probably coming working with England that I now expect uh, and you know I'm a tracksuit man and I want the nice facilities and I want things done correctly. So those are the thoughts of the Brighton manager Peter Taylor. Right well here's the chairman Dick Knight you're responsible for so much of this and first of all congratulations on another amazing season. Thank you very much yeah it's been uh, it just shows that in uh, even in modern football miracles can happen you know remember five years ago we were bottom of the pile uh, on the last day of the season, we need to, you know, to get a point to save ourselves, and we did. And uh, here we are now, going for the second division championship. Well, Miracles can happen. Well, well done on that. But I'm going to cut to the quick and push you on this. Um, 
Are you going to have Peter Taylor at the helm next year? Are you going to improve these training facilities or whatever it is he's after? Look, today is a day of celebration. This club has moved tremendously in five years and we will continue to make progress and we will continue to address the issues that we have to, to that befits a first division club. So today is about celebration. We're all going to have a good time and uh, we'll address the issues in the near future. Well, Dick, I mean, last time I was here, it was actually you had a big party for the centenary celebrations. Well, you just seem to do nothing but partying down here. Do you ever do any work? Well, we, uh, we, it's the hard work that enables us to party. <laughs> so, you know, we know how to have a good time in Brighton, and we're going to have a good time uh, today, whatever the score, because we've got two successive promotions. That's a mighty, mighty achievement, and all credit to Peter, you know, his staff, Mickey Adams before him, and, of course, the players. You know, remember that we have got this back-to-back uh, -back promotion achievement uh, virtually on the strength of the same squad that won us the third division title last year. You know, we just had two players come in, mo both made massive contributions, Simon Morgan and Junior Lewis more recently. But, uh, you know, it's the same squad and all credit to them and the, and the two managers. We've been blessed with great managers, fantastic squad of players. Uh, and not that it doesn't only include Bobby. Bobby Zamora is, of course, exceptional, but the other squad of players, the whole team, have just performed brilliantly and they all deserve every bit of success they've got right now. Well, Dick, I'm going to let you get on with it. Thanks very much. Enjoy your day, because whatever happens, I'm sure you will. Thanks <laughs> Right, well, not every team in Division 2 can win the championship. Bury certainly can't. They're facing a big battle against relegation, and they were at home against Colchester. Barring the kind of freak result which frankly never happens, Bury are relegated. The Shakers go into next week's final game at Peterborough, three points and 18 goals adrift of Knox County and safety. Their failure to take several good chances against Colchester suggests they won't improve on that goal difference. And Scott McLeish's opening goal for the visitors showed Berry's other problem, a defence which lives up to the club's nickname. That was underlined again 20 minutes from time when Lee Unsworth's error gifted Adrian Coote with Colchester's second. But at least off the field, Berry's future looks a little brighter. Three potential buyers are lined up to save the club from administration and the council have agreed a £50,000 sponsorship deal for next season if Berry survived. Chris Billy gave them hope of a footballing lifeline, but that was banished when the defence vanished again just three minutes from time. The result was that Coote strolled in for his second and Colchester's third. Berry manager Andy Priest can now plan for third division football next season and he has no complaints. We've been at the bottom, you know, probably all season, uh, near enough all season. We've managed to get out uh, when we play Wickham, about four or five points clear. And that's where we had to, to kick on and say, right, we're not going back in there. And we, we never managed to do it. And then everything goes our way today and we're not, we can't capitalise again. So we only have ourselves to blame. You know, the, we've had the chances to, to get ourselves out of it and make sure that we're still in the second division. So, uh, you know, the bl blame lies firmly with us. Managers send centre-halves forward at corner kicks to do exactly that. Canadian international Jason DeVos's fifth goal of the season saw Wigan take an early lead against Northampton. He seemed in a relaxed mood, safe in the knowledge that they would not be relegated. Much will be expected of Wigan next season and in particular of costly striker Nathan Ellington. He got to a ball that should have been claimed by Cogler's keeper Keith Welsh to add a goal on his home debut to the one he got at Chesterfield in his first game since joining from Bristol Rovers. The trickery of Scottish winger Gary Teal was troubling Northampton. He set up a chance for Andy Little, then delivered a cross that almost led to another goal for Ellington. Wigan's domination was almost total and a third goal duly arrived. Teal again was involved. Great skill. And although it was nice for Scott Green to score, Teal probably deserved it more. Bourne have kept alive their survival hopes with a comprehensive victory over Chesterfield. Anything less than a win would have sent Sean O'Driscoll's side down to Division 3. And they responded by taking the lead just past the half hour. Derek Holmes heading in Warren Feeney's cross. Feeney picked up the Player of the Season award before kickoff. He'll play for Northern Ireland against Spain in midweek. Another sign as to his quality. He scored Bournemouth second after Nathan Abbey fumbled Jason Tyndall's shot. The former lead striker finished with ease. Goal number three came two minutes later. Again, Feeney was involved, brought down by Stuart Howson just inside the area. Not much question about the trip from Howson. 
Wade Elliott confidently put away the penalty and Bournemouth's fans sensed a miracle escape. Chesterfield did pull a goal back three minutes from the end, Howson with a consolation, but other results leave Bournemouth needing a win at Wrexham, and even that might not be enough. Cambridge already down, Tranmere out of the playoff picture, two teams with nothing to play for and how it showed, until a free kick by Gareth Roberts woke everybody up. It was a crazy angle to score from and it set the tone for a strange afternoon. Soon after the break, Cambridge were level thanks to Luke Guttridge's delivery and a big moment for David Bridges. The teenager's first goal for the club he supported as a boy was followed 20 minutes later by Tom Young's ninth of the season, another close-range header this time from Shane Tudor's cross. So Cambridge finished their home campaign with only their seventh victory, but not before giving their fans a rare chance to smile. After Tranmere defender Clint Hill had handled, keeper Lino Perez stepped up to mark his last appearance at the Abbey Stadium with the spot kick. The Frenchman strode forward with typical confidence, but the outcome was all too predictable given Cambridge's season. An easy save for opposite number Joe Murphy. And now Cambridge head to Northampton next week with their last chance for a first away win of the season. It's great to see Sean Devine fit again and scoring freely for Wickham. This was his 70th league game since leaving Barnet, and that was his 36th goal. Not a bad record. 2-0 arrived on the quarter hour. Referee Phil Jocelyn spotted some jostling by Lee Duxbury on Andy Rammel. And veteran midfielder Steve Brown beat David Miskelly from the spot. Just. Oldham have struggled recently, managing just one win in their previous seven games. They pulled one goal back at Adams Park, and again it came from a penalty. Never mind Julian Bode's clear foul on home keeper Martin Taylor. Bode had already been held by Mark Rogers. Not that he seemed to know it, and referee Jocelyn had already awarded a spot kick. Sub Alan Smart found the net, but Oldham couldn't find an equaliser. Join us in part three when we'll have all the rest of the action from Division Two and we'll be joining Brighton on what they hope is their championship party. See you then. Football second with National League. Football matters. This weekend, the 2002 British Superbikes Championship speeds back onto ITV Sport Plus. Steve Hislop grabbed the lead in a gruelling race at Silverstone. Can the other riders get back on track in the second round at Brands Hatch? Find out today from 12.30, live on ITV Sport Plus. Football second with Nation. Football matters. Welcome back to Football Second. It's time now for the action in our featured match. Brighton have made it two promotions in two years. Can they make that a back-to-back -back championship? Well, Bobby Zamora is rated as a potential Premiership player on what could be title-winning day. Brighton fans can dream of being there with him. Gary Hart's broken leg has been the one negative of a great week. Nathan Jones comes in for him. Lee Steele's suspension allows Daniel Webb to return to the side. Eric Saban's five goals and all-round contribution have made him Swindon's version of Thierry Henry. He's a real danger, but another of Swindon's stars misses out. Danny Invincible's groin injury looks to have ended his season two games early. Well, a Brighton win, and they'll become only the seventh team to win consecutive championships. Anything else, and they'll hope for slip-ups from Reading and Brentford, and that might still be enough. Really great atmosphere at the With Dean. They're absolutely packed in, albeit only 7,000 of them. There's Mayo. This is Brooker. Oh, he's managed to turn inside, and Brooker's got a real chance. And one which he couldn't take. Had it fallen to that man, Zamora, it may well have had a very different outcome. He opened his body up, shoved it wide. Zamora, the inevitable target. Lewis is up there as well. This is Brooker trying to skip his way through. 
And then maybe Savannah a chance on the counter attack. He has great pace and power. It's a fabulous run for him, Savannah. <laughs> Needed the challenge from Morgan, who defended that very well. Paul Watson to take the free kick. Who swung in dangerously towards Morgan. Really good pressure this from Brighton. The crowd have come to see goals. Greenick stayed on his line. In the end, it was Daniel Webb with the header. Son of Dave on loan from South End. And just have done better with that. Just about the first touch Kuypers has had. Picked on by Carpenter. Zamora's in the centre of a Brooker to Ava. Drops again to Webb. Hasn't really found his range. And they're getting so much encouragement from this crowd, as they have in this eight-game unbeaten run that's taken them to the brink of the title. It's already taken them up. It's a good run as well. He's gone down. Nathan Jones. Goal kick is the decision. Take another look at this. He just lost control of it, Jones, before he tumbled. I think it would have been harsh. And Kerry Mayo. Forward by Morgan. A little more purpose about the build-up now from Brighton. Might open up here for Zamora. Straight at Greening, but it is one of the fascinations of Brighton as to how he'll do at a higher level again. Will he be good enough for the first division? Everything points to the fact that he will be. 28 goals this season. This is Watson. Good tackling back, but it might have released Zamora. Well, they want the back pass. But they won't get it. Greenick holding on. Another facet, though, of Bobby Zamora's game. And great awareness as well. This is great. He's trying to barrel his way forward. Away by Hayward. Now Junior Lewis. How important he's been for them. Here's Zamora, lovely little dummy. And Mayer. Rather disappointing, but much, much better from Brighton. Again, Zamora trying to make something from nothing. Might drop here for Gray. Peter Taylor is understandably frustrated here. They need a win to be sure of the title. And they would like to clinch that at home. And the bunting is ready. This is Saban in the meantime, though, trying to spoil the party. And Hewlett's effort. And Andy King says that when he was previously at Swindon, they could have bought Zamora. For 80,000 fans, he's watching on rather ruefully, wishing that his Swindon side had the big man. Now Lewis. It's a really good ball for Hadlam. And that's a fine save by Greenick. The substitute, Phil Hadlin, going as close as anyone. Lewis has controlled the midfield. Now Hadlin. Zamora in the centre. This is Carpenter. Touched on by Gray. And Lewis arriving late and ineffectively. And Peter Taylor knows that time is running out. And there's the final whistle. Neither Reading nor Brentford have won. And that means that Brighton under Peter Taylor are champions. Andy King is the first to lend his congratulations. 
And now the party can start at the Wizdy. Back up to the second flight of English football for the first time in 10 years. And the captain, Paul Rogers, comes forward to receive the trophy along with Peter Taylor. There's Dick Knight, who's done so much for this club since taking over. Rogers has had his fair share of glories, beating Coventry with Sutton United all those years ago. And success with Wigan as well. He lifted the third division championship trophy last season. And unbelievably, he'll lift the second division title this season. Brighton have done it back to back. Tremendous achievement from Nicky Adams and then Peter Taylor. The former Leicester manager has kept the momentum going. And all they need now is the planning permission for that new stadium at Farmer. Then the jigsaw will be complete. They hope with the current manager still in charge. A Formula One celebration for the side that has motored through the divisions. Congratulations to Brighton and Hove Albion. some very proud moments as a player and as a manager in a, in a young managerial career. How does this rank alongside your other achievements? Well, it's lovely. It's, it's a great honour to win a championship and uh, it's Division 2 for Brighton. It's fantastic. Now, they're in, now we're in Division 1. It's a great feeling for the players and uh, we're sure today that we're not always the best team but we're always the best fighters. Doesn't matter, does it? I mean, just the look on your players' faces there as they put the medals around their necks and like, raise that cup in the air, sort of uh, send it all. They're very proud. They're very honest workers that keep improving every day and, uh, and I'm absolutely Absolutely delightful. Bobby, congratulations. You didn't hit the back of the net today, but 30, what is it, 32 goals so far? 32 this season, so over the moon. It's been an amazing year for you, hasn't it? And for me and all the lads, all the lads, two on the bounce now, it's something special. And how did this feel today? I mean, just a look on your face in particular up there on the podium. You were jumping across everyone in your excitement, weren't you? No, yes. Just, I mean, I'm speechless, to be honest. I, I, um, Right. You've got many more days like this to come, I suspect, in your yeah. career, Bobby. I hope so. Brighton's the party capital of the South East, and I suspect that the party brewing behind me is going to go on for a very, very long time yet. Right, let's find out how exactly Brighton were crowned champions today, and it all hinged on that match at the Medeski Stadium. If you're of a nervous disposition, it's not a good time to be a Reading fan. Having drawn seven out of eight going into this match, they would have expected to do well against Peterborough. But Barry Fry's side, with just pride to play for, had other ideas. They had a helping hand, literally from Reading keeper Phil Whitehead, who completely misjudged Matthew Gill's long-range effort. Reading brought on Martin Butler back after five months out injured and Sammy Igo at half-time. That seemed to spark a revival. A quickly taken free kick produced the equaliser. Nicky Forster with a well-taken goal. The Reading fans among the 22,000-plus crowd would have expected their side to go on and wrap up the points and guarantee themselves Division I football next season. Forster set up Butler, but Gill cleared off the line. Then an indirect free kick produced another chance. Butler again denied, this time by keeper Luke Steele. With everybody back for Peterborough, Reading were able to launch the ball forward again. Sammy Igo picked out John Solarco at the far post, and his cut back was headed in by Nicky Forster for his 18th and what could have been most important goal of the season. Reading had to hold out for just 11 minutes. They managed four. Substitute Andy Clark survived a handball appeal to cross for Leon McKenzie to bundle the ball over the line. Reading played Brentford next week to decide the second automatic spot. There was so much more than just London pride at stake at Loftus Road. Brentford were looking for a win to put towards their promotion push. Lloyd Owusu won the ball for the Bees and by the time it arrived in the area, Owusu was there too and so nearly followed up after Mark McCammon had struck a post. 
McCammon was making his 15th appearance this season for Brentford, and he's still waiting for his first goal. These two teams drew nil all at Griffin Park back in November. And guess what? Same again. Blackpool's last home game of the season saw them bang in five against Bristol City. Bournemouth ended a run of six without a win against Chesterfield. But Huddersfield's victory against Port Vale was absolutely vital after a recent rocky run. Brentford couldn't get the win they wanted in the West London derby. But rivals Reading couldn't beat Peterborough, so the drama at the top will continue until the final day next Saturday. Just one round of games left, and most of the issues are settled in the second. Brighton are the champions, and Cardiff, Stoke and Huddersfield have all reached the playoffs. It's the second automatic promotion place that provides the intrigue, and Brentford will take on Reading at Griffin Park on Saturday to sort that one out. It's pretty straightforward at the bottom. The bottom four will stay the bottom four if Notts County take a point from their home game with Huddersfield next weekend. So that's it from Football Second on a day when, in fact, after all that, only one thing was decided and Brighton were crowned champions. Congratulations to them. Bury and Bournemouth at the bottom live just about to fight another day. But that race for the second automatic promotion place, that will go right to the wire. Brentford and Reading. They play each other next week at Griffin Park. Guess where we'll be? See you then. Football second with Nationwide. Football matters.